And all right, uh, Liz, congratulations on receiving two Emmy nominations for your documentary, What oh. Happened, Miss Simone. You've Thank also you. received, you're welcome. You were also nominated for an Oscar for Best Documentary Feature for the film. So it's been a pretty good year for you, to say the least. Um, <laughs> tell us, what does this kind of recognition mean for you for the film? Um, you know, it's, uh, what does it mean? I mean, I guess it means the film continues to be in the conversation. So people will continue to go and seek it out and watch it. Um, you know, it's immensely satisfying for all of us who worked on the film for the film to have such a long life. Um, we premiered the film in, uh, January of 2015 at Sundance and opened uh, theatrically that summer. Of course, went on Netflix. Um, and then, you know, last year, because of award stuff, the film was continued to be in the conversation. So now it's been, you know, uh, 19 months of the film, you know, having having a life and being talked about. So in, to the extent that awards acknowledgement extends the life of the film, it's thrilling. And of course, you know, it, uh, it I guess, you know, it, it's just, and it helps, of course, you know, with other films when we're talking about them. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful acknowledgement for the whole crew that worked on it. And, well, you know, and the film was nominated, but then also, you know, there was a, the editor was nominated and the DP and, you know, so it, it's really wonderful. Of course, when the Oscar nomination happens, you know, everybody's part of that, but it's really wonderful for the craft categories and for, for those, those partners of, our, of mine to, to be, get nominations as well. Well, congratulations again. Uh, it's very well deserved. Uh, talk about Nina Simone. Why? Uh, what made her a fascinating subject for a documentary? I mean, I guess that's pretty obvious. But more to the point, what made it something that you wanted to do? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's an excellent question, and I don't think it's obvious. I mean, I think you know people approach. You know, I've done a, f a couple of films. I had done before Nina a couple of films about biographical figures, Bobby Fischer being one, Marilyn Monroe being another. And, you know, so people would sometimes suggest biographical figures to me at, for, as subjects for films. And not every life, no matter, even if a person has sort of, ex you know, accomplished extraordinary feats of in sports, arts, or, you know, other arenas, does it make for a, a rich film subject? Um, Nina's life it certainly did though. I think um, part of, you know, when I look at a film and I think about why do I want to make this film, how, you know, you are going to spend, you know, four years of your life with this person. It's a little bit of a, you know, maybe it's not a marriage, but it's certainly a long-term relationship with that subject. You have to feel like, you know, of course you have to sort of love them, I think is part of it. I mean, even with a character like Bobby Fischer where he was complicated and became late in life an anti-Semite, you know, I still felt that sort of, I still felt that care for him. And I think that's really important as a filmmaker because you are living with these subjects. It's important for me anyway. Um, of course, Nina was like Bobby Fischer, very, very complicated, suffered from mental illness. There are a lot of people who she pushed away very, very far away, people who didn't want to even talk about her. Um, so she had that toothiness, but I think within that complicatedness of Nina, what you saw was the history of our time, and you saw the way that racism and injustice affected a human being um, on top of psychological factors that have always interested me, like the relationship between art and genius. Um, so, and of course, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that has been happening in our culture, that sort of, that came to, um, to what you you know sort of while we were way in process but then of course as the film was as we were editing the film it felt more relevant and than ever and of course audiences have received it in that way and i think it was just it turned out to be the right time to be telling this story that was a very long answer but no 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 i mean she's a, a fascinating subject and uh her story wouldn't exist without the backdrop of the time in which she was coming up in. You know, I mean, you Absolutely. look at, it, it's fascinating to see the evolution of her career and her music set against the backdrop of the time. Could you talk a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, Nina's music cannot be separated from the time. Um, you know, when she came up as a, I mean, right from the start of her career, we can look at it that way. I mean, she came up playing piano in the church. Her mother was a preacher, so she played at church. Early on, she, she grew up in a small southern town, and early on, um, the folks in the town, white and black, realized that there was a piano pro prodigy here. And the town got together and shipped in money for her to have very proper, proper classical piano lessons. And her dream was to become the first black classical piano at Carnegie Hall. Um, it became after uh, not uh, the, the money ran out for her education. She did not get into Curtis, which would have been the, the state funded way for her to continue that education at the highest level. Um, her family had all moved north for her, so she had to start playing in bars. That's when uh, Nina Simone, as we know her, was born. The little girl who was named Eunice Wayman at birth became Nina Simone. She changed her name because she didn't want her mother to know that she was playing the devil's music. Um, and she was playing piano in bars. The owner went up to her and said, you got to sing if you're going to make any money here tonight, you know, if, if you want to stay. So she started singing, and this is how this talent emerges. That's in the late 50s. Of course, in the 60s, there's something else going on, right? She becomes, you know, she was not a political activist, you know, as a student, but she became, of course, incredibly politicized during the 60s. And that's where this woman who was playing porgy and jazz standards became the fully complex, deep-throated, brave, complex, unforgettable artist that became Nina Simone. And in terms of your approach to the filmmaking, can you talk a bit about uh, the style in which you decided to tell this story uh, in order to best suit her complicated life? Yeah, well, we started out um, wanting, I started out, you know, I didn't want to go shooting interviews. I wanted to find everything that I could about Nina Simone that had been left on this planet. Um, we had gotten boxes and boxes um, from her daughter that her daughter had cleaned out of her house in France. So from there we had photos and diaries, um, you know, pay slips, contracts, sheet music um, of Nina. Going further, of course, you we found all, you know as many filmed concerts as we could, and then as many filmed interviews. But that wasn't really enough. So then we went into the audio archive, finding radio interviews from Nina um, from the early '60s, and you know they did very in-depth radio interviews with artists where she would talk you know for an hour about her beginnings and her her evolution as an artist then uh, we learned through our research that Nina had attempted uh, many uh, memoir to write many memoirs with ghostwriters who had recorded their conversations we were able to find those conversations from the University of Nebraska to someone's garage in North Carolina to the Pyrenees and the mountains from a, um, a, a British man who was now living in, in uh, the French Pyrenees so from all over the world we collected Nina and I before I shot a frame I processed and listened to all of that so for me, it was like, what, what if I had interviewed Nina? What would she be telling me? What would she be focusing on? And because I was able to listen to so many people asking her the questions that I might have asked, I began to see the patterns and what were the important stories for her in her life that made her who she was. And so I took those stories. Um, when you're making a 93 minute or whatever film, you're going to omit, of course, huge periods of, of a person's life. But for me, I focused on the stories that Nina continually went back to, because clearly those were the ones that she felt made her who she was. Right, absolutely. Uh, so give us some, uh, you know, documentary filmmaking 101, nuts, uh, nuts and bolts. Uh, you know, when you're assembling all this footage, are you, are you going off of an outline that you've created or, you know, what's what's that process like? Yeah, I don't put much stock in outlines. And, you know, thankfully, uh, I think that, you know, when I'm when I'm working with financiers or distributors, um, I think they don't either. I think that, you know, you sometimes you need to submit proposals and paperwork or, you know, uh, uh, outlines in order to make people feel like, okay, if all else goes wrong, at least we have this. Um, but really, the great things that you find in the film are not the things that are on your outline, because that represents what you know on day one. On day 100, you know so much more. On day 200, you know so much more. So for me, it's really not about an outline. It's really about that process of listening and letting the material guide, you, know, guide you. Otherwise, you're kind of like you know, having this confirmation hypothesis. I think um, you know, then you, you go out asking certain questions because you have your fixed understanding of a human being rather than letting all the material kind of have an effect on you and then going from there. Did you find your style, uh, your editorial style, I guess, uh, changing 
in terms of pacing or, or rhythm uh, evolving throughout the film as Nina's story evolves. Does that make sense? Um, um, you mean, did we change stylistically to represent the various periods of her life? Is that kind of... Like in a way, not? yeah. I mean, it, it, the, the, the film is more or less consistent, I found. But I mean, in, in order to uh, convey sort of her emotional state or, or how her music was changing, I mean, did you find your filmmaking approach changing at all? Or Well, you know, I think one of the things that was, that was always important, and it's like one of the frustrations I've had in watching other music films is that you know you want to hear the music mm -hmm. and that you know that one of the things that was I mean I don't know if this is really answering your question but I'll but I'll respond this way you know was we wanted to let songs play long you know and I think that Nina's songs all had an arc to them she was telling a story and even if it was a cover you know don't let me be misunderstood or um ain't got no she was doing something very very different and sort of turning that cover on its head on its other side and um and I think you needed to go through the arc of the song with her um, and of course, you know, some of those songs went as recordings would play one way and then in live performance would play a totally different way. So it was kind of, you know, for us, it was like I could, you know, there were songs that I loved that I was desperate to get into the film, but I couldn't find the right performance. Um, I had, you know, and so there were, there were things that we really let the performance and her delivery guide us um, in, in that way. And I think we did, we let, we let it play out long. Um, you know, Nina would get irate often in some of the audio recordings. We, I think we let some of that energy of hers build at the right times in the cut um, to represent how desperate she was feeling at times. Um, so that's how I would answer that. Right. I, maybe that's what I was picking up on subconsciously because you do, um, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what you were saying, letting the songs play out, that is unique for a music documentary, but it does really give you the, the scope of what she was going through at that time, you know. Well, yeah, and I think what we did, and, I, and I've said this before, but, you know, we, I, I, we structured the film as, as a musical, right? So that every song is telling a part of the story. And I think, I think that's what I'm trying to say. You know, so if, you're, if we're singing Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, we are, you know, which is, you know, we're using that performance. We're talking about her struggles to be, um, to be who she was in this world, a dark-skinned African-American performer who was demanding to be heard and demanding justice and how complicated that role was. It wasn't a role that anybody had played before Nina Simone. Um, or if we are, you know, we were listening to, uh, you know, Strange Fruit, we're talking about in the injustices in the Jim Crow South where she came up. So it was structured as a musical where yeah, every song had to do the work of a storytelling function. And that's why the songs played long, not just for our enjoyment, but also because they were helping us tell her story. And again, and then when I say that anytime, even if she's using, we're doing a cover, she's making it personal and narrative. And so that's what one has to be appreciated about those songs. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, along with all of this, uh, you know, these interviews that you have for archival interviews and this, uh, these photographs and uh, her, uh, audio recordings, you're able to more or less allow her to tell her own story in her own words. Uh, was that part of your approach to it? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, like when you asked earlier is how much is the outline, you know, when you, what you think about on day one of the project and what it actually comes out to be, the truth is I could have not, and I, I could not have anticipated we would recover as much um, audio recording never heard before as we did. I had no idea that she had tried many times to, you know, write a memoir that other people helped her write and record and that those folks would have kept those tapes and that we would be able to get them from 30, 40 years back. So, um, yes, as much as possible, Nina guided the storytelling in that way once we were able to find what she had left behind. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the things that you had to lose or cut out that uh, were particularly painful, but for the better of the film. The little treasure troves where we do a little trick on ourselves and we put them in a bin on the avid where we say, you know, things we're going to come back to later, but we know we're just like tricking ourselves and that we have to lose them. <laughs> well, for instance, there was one, there's one song that's one of my favorite songs that Nina wrote called Four Women. Um, and there was a performance of that song 
that it was the one, it's sort of like the one that got away, like a love story, and that, you know, we just could not convince the rights holder to license us, license it to us. And it was really the only case where that happened. Um, most people really got on board. And I was completely mesmerized by this one performance she had of that song in which I felt like she gave it full, full meaning. And um, the other performances that we found were just very staid and very controlled and didn't really tell the story in that way. So a lot of people said, you know, Four Women is my favorite song. You know, how can you not have it in there? And I was like, you know, I feel you. That was one. And then, you know, there were many love affairs she had. Um, over the course and of, of her life and you know there were allusions to perhaps dalliances with other women but we could never quite get someone to, to, to sort of talk about that on camera so there were there were things that you know perhaps you know it, it would have been wonderful to have the time to explore but Nina led a very very full and complex life and um, I think we got a lot in there. Mm -hmm. So there are interviews in the film uh, were those conducted by you or was there someone on your team who Oh no, I do all my interviews. Well, there are inter any interviews that are in the film I did, and then but then there were also interviews that we that were archival. Right, right, not, right. Well, not and but not all, just of Nina, which is obvious because she's passed away, but but also of her husband, uh, mm -hmm. Andy Stroud. Those were interviews that were done because Andy also died is also dead by the time I started production. Um, those were interviews that were done by his daughter Lisa. But in yeah. terms of uh, interviews that look. Modern, yes, those were done by me. So then that leads me to my next question. I wanted to make sure okay. I ask you this without knowing. Um, what is your approach when you're getting ready to interview Nina's daughter or people who knew her? Uh, you know, do you do a lot of research beforehand? Uh, you know, do you jot out your questions? Uh, give me some advice as an interviewer. <laughs> Okay, well, no, you're doing just well. Great. Oh, thank you. I mean, you. what I do is I've usually, I usually just, you know, it, I'm not saying anything that's, that's um, you know, has, you know, it was a great discovery, but I'll read everything and watch everything that that person has done before and note things that they've said and any, you know, book of, of uh, you know, about Nina that contained references to those guys, I'll try to see where they've intersect, intersected and great stories that might have been captured. You know, sometimes there are, um, you know, newspaper clippings from the 60s in which I'll have seen that maybe they did a show together and I'll be able to bring that up. Um, and so I'll, you know, I'll kind of go in with five typed pages of questions so I can make sure that I'm hitting all the beats that I want. But then I usually kind of put those, cast those aside and um, we'll own, and we're really, you know, many, many questions will come just from the listening, you know, and so somebody will say something and that will just take me into a totally different direction and I'll go down that tangent for some time. So, so really I, I use those notes as crutches, um, but then it's really in the listening and what, you know, where that goes. And the other thing that I think is really valuable as a report, as a, when you're interviewing is to in, not necessarily in a, in a reporter, in a reporter sense, but in the filmmaking genre is silence and what off, what happens after people are done talking. Um, and oftentimes they will then go on to the thought that you couldn't have anticipated or you couldn't have, uh, even asked about, or maybe it's the more difficult thing that they didn't want to address first. And I often find that if I allow us to sit in silence for some period of time, they might go someplace else that I hadn't, that I wouldn't have known to ask about. Mm -hmm. You spoke about this earlier uh, when you were talking about what made you want to do the film, but I wonder if we could delve into it a bit more. Nina's relevance to today uh, in terms of social activism, what her story means for people today. Yeah, I mean, look, when, you know, Radical Media brought this project to me in um, 2013, you know, and um, I, I think that's right. And, um, you know, there, I've, and I've, I've had a history of making films in the criminal justice system and on social justice issues and then also biographical films. Um, but, uh, you know, these issues have never not been... Um, front and center in my mind as a filmmaker and just as a citizen of, of this world. Um, but certainly they had been, I think really since 9-11, on the back burner of public conversation until Mike Ferguson. And until, I mean, but until Mike Brown uh, was killed in Ferguson. Right. And until those protests ignited in the streets and the Black Lives Matter movement um, brought everything back to the forefront, which had always been simmering on the stove, but you know, was began to boil over and people were paying attention in a way that they hadn't been for a long time. Um, 
my, you know, Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson. The events were unfolding while we were in our edit room. And of course, I couldn't, you know, nobody could ignore the fact that the civil rights footage that we were editing looked very much like the tanks rolling down the street in Ferguson. So certainly, while I had already been focused on that period in Nina's life, it felt all the more urgent. You know, while we were making the film, you know, John Legend got up on the Oscars during his uh, performance of the Selma song and gave a shout out to Nina Simone, quoting her, saying, it's an artist's duty to represent the time. And that's something that Nina said back in 1969. And I think that message about the artist and her duty, um, or his duty, um, was one that many, many artists start to listen to, adopt, and take as a call to action. I mean, we see how Beyonce's career has evolved over the past couple of years into a much more political focus. Um, I think that's part of um, a resurgence of Nina Simone, quite frankly, and appreciation of other political artists that are now sort of coming out into the pop mainstream. Look, and there have always been political artists. Mm -hmm. I just think that Nina has, has um, been a great role model, or great shoulders to stand on for other artists today. Well, it's extraordinary too that uh, in her activism, you know, the music is able to stand the test of time, even just as music, you know, outside of the uh, social context of the time. Uh, it, it's uh, what I really love about the movie is that it's a testament to the power of whatever art you have to uh, help in your cause or to help in Simone's case with herself, you know, with her own mental health. Uh, you know, was that a, a, a goal of it too? I think so. I mean, I think, look, when you march, when you have the Selma Montgomery march, you know, what's at the end of that march? Harry Belafonte, you know, Bob Dylan, Nina Simone, you know, there was this really intrinsic relationship or, you know, uh, you know, yeah, like the, the mesh between artists and the movement was, was, you know, really full and complex and deep. And, and it was a reward for those marchers to go and then see their famous artists, like give them validation and be like, you know, you made it. And I think that's huge. And I think the power of celebrity can be used in that way to motivate people and reward them for their sacrifice and commitment. And I think that type of thing is, you know, and like, look, Mississippi Goddamn, you know, the, the Birmingham church bombing, we had, you know, a massacre in a black church uh, last year. Um, yeah, these songs are timeless, unfortunately. And, um, and I think that what Nina Simone represents is the real impact artists can have in keeping that movement alive and energized and positive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much and congratulations again. And it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks for talking about our film on your show. You're welcome. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.